Welcome back to a new session in Dentistry and More. Today's topic is Developmental Disturbances of Teeth. So the Developmental Disturbances of Teeth basically uh, arranged in four categories. That is the disturbances related to size. Second one is number. Third one is shape or form. And the fourth one is uh, which is involving formation of enamel and dentin. Uh, so the enamel and dentin uh related disturbances we have already covered that was uh, enamel uh, involving amelogenesis imperfecta dentin involving dentinogenesis imperfecta dentin dysplasia and regional odontodysplasia so now uh, we are seeing about uh, the size related developmental disturbances so let's see what is uh, the size related problems that is the developmental problems associated with teeth so developmental disturbances of teeth related to size basically divided into two categories that is microdontia and macrodontia. So the name itself gives the answer for it. One is micro and another one is macro. So we know what is micro and macro. Micro is nothing but smaller than normal. Macro is larger than normal. So teeth which are smaller than normal is microdontia teeth which are larger than normal is macrodontia. So in both categories we have three subdivisions that is true generalized microdontia, relative generalized microdontia, focal or localized microdontia. Similarly true generalized macrodontia, relative generalized macrodontia, focal or localized macrodontia. Let's see one by one. The first one is microdontia. That is true generalized microdontia. True generalized is actually the teeth are smaller than normal. The teeth actually are normal. It is commonly seen in pituitary dwarfism and which is very rare and teeth are well formed but it is smaller than normal. The next one is relative generalized microdontia. So here the thing is there is relative microdontia. The teeth are normal or slightly smaller than normal but there is no obvious uh, microdontia. The teeth are actually normal or slightly smaller than normal. But the problem is the jaws are the jaws are little larger than the normal. So when comparing to a bigger or larger jaw, the teeth appears smaller, but actually it is a normal or slightly smaller teeth which are present in slightly larger jaws. So this is the point. The jaws are bigger. So it appears comparing with larger jaws, it is smaller. That is why this name, the relative generalized, it is comparing to bigger jaws it is appearing as micro teeth. So that is the relative generalized microdontia. Now we have the third category that is focal or localized. So it is a very localized condition. So focal or localized are very common comparing with these three subtypes that is lateral incisor and third molar. The lateral incisor microdontia is also known as peg lateral because there will be a conical shaped lateral incisor compared to the normal square almost square type lateral incisor because there will be converging of tooth incisally. A cone shaped crown will be in peg lateral. So this is the peg lateral. This is a normal tooth. This is central incisor, lateral incisor canine. So the normal lateral incisor will have close contact with mesial and mesial and distal side of mesial side of canine and distal side of central incisor. But in peg lateral, the problem is with the in towards the incisal edge, it goes tapering. There will be constriction or converging towards the incisal end. So this is focal microdontia this is commonly seen 
and uh, third molar also uh, commonly involved but it is not very clinically obvious only dentist is um, able to visualize it but since it coming in the anterior um, side the peg lateral is very visible and even the person also is well aware of his peg lateral rather than the third molar microdontia if the person has both so peg lateral is a microdontia or focal or localized microdontia which is common uh, with the third molar so it may be either one or two uh, will be present in a patient or person so while well, coming to macrodontia we have the same categories that is true generalized relative generalized or focal or localized so true generalized means there is actual bigger teeth compared to the normal size it is seen in pituitary gigantism the microdontia seen in pituitary dwarfism so we know what is dwarf and what is a gigantic person the person himself will be uh, having a bigger body or lower body comparably all the uh, body parts will be of that size if it is dwarf if it is a gigantic person so that is true generalized relative generalized the problem is patient is having or the person is having smaller jaws the teeth are normal in size but since the jaws are little smaller than the normal the teeth will look bigger or larger and it results in crowding so there will be insufficient arch space because the jaws are smaller than the normal so the crowding will be there and teeth appears to be larger so it is because of the smaller jaws here it is because of the bigger jaws and the third one is focal or localized which is commonly seen in uh, third molar and it is a very rare condition mm, unlike the microdontia which is actually very common the focal or localized is very common in microdontia whereas this is uh, Mm, little uh, rare in case of macrodontia so it is a very very simple topic mm, what is uh, microdontia and what is macrodontia only thing you need to uh, understand this concept that is relative generalized microdontia and relative generalized macrodontia this is only confusing terminology in this uh, developmental disturbance of size here the jaws are normal Uh, larger than normal here the jaws are smaller than normal so that's all about uh, the size developmental disturbances of teeth so i'll come up with the number uh, in next video so the takeaway points is peg lateral so peg lateral is a focal or localized microdontia so i'll come up with the developmental disturbances of number in my next hello everyone welcome back to a new session in dentistry and more so let's continue our developmental disturbances of teeth so last session we had covered uh, regarding the size problem that was microdontia and macrodontia so today's session is about uh, the number the developmental disturbances of teeth related to number so basically we have two types that is supernumerary and anodontia so let's get into the details of developmental disturbances of teeth with respect to number so the supernumerary teeth it's also known as hyperdontia hyperdontia it's more number of uh, teeth present uh, compared to the normal and anodontia is loss of teeth so first let's see anodontia then we'll move on to the supernumerary teeth so anodontia we have four types the first one is total anodontia partial anodontia false anodontia and pseudo anodontia in all cases the teeth are missing compared to the number of teeth are less compared to the normal uh, 
regular number of teeth that is 32 in permanent and 20 in deciduous. So what is total anodontia? Total anodontia is a complete loss of teeth. The patient is edentulous and it is very very rare condition and it is seen in a syndrome known as hereditary ectodermal dysplasia. We know teeth is formed from um, ectoderm. Uh, we have seen ectoderm, endoderm, meso mesoderm, mesoderm. Uh, so ectoderm is a portion where from which uh, the teeth uh, origin. So hereditary condition of dysplasia of ectoderm. So it results in complete loss of teeth or there will not be any teeth at all. That is anodontia. Now we have partial anodontia partial means there will be few teeth are missing it can be hypodontia or oligodontia hypodontia is if one or more teeth missing we can say there is hypodontia and six or more teeth are missing we can say oligodontia so most common missing teeth are lateral incisor third molars or maxillary uh, or mandibular second premolar so which are these lateral incisor third molars maxillary and mandibular second premolar now we have false anodontia false anodontia is when the teeth are missing that is like exfoliated or extracted so these two conditions there will be false anodontia teeth will be missing when it is exfoliated normally or if it is extracted for any reasons it could be uh, dental caries extraction it could be uh, orthodontic extraction or any reasons if teeth are missing we can say it is a false anodontia and another condition is pseudo anodontia actually pseudo anodontia the teeth are actually present but not clinically present so it could be impacted, it could be uh, delayed eruption. So these conditions, the jaw appears to be uh, without teeth, one or more teeth, so many teeth. So that condition is known as pseudo anodontia. So teeth might erupt, it might not erupt, but teeth are there inside the gums or inside the jaw. So that is known as pseudo anodontia, which is clinically absent teeth, which is due to impaction or delayed eruption so these are the four types of anodontia it is a common question one is total anodontia partial anodontia false anodontia and pseudo anodontia total is complete loss partial could be hypo or oligo false could be uh, due to exfoliated or extracted and pseudo it could be clinically absent condition so most common are lateral incisor, third molar, maxillary or mandibular, second premolar. Now we'll move on to the supernumerary teeth. Supernumerary teeth, there will be more number of teeth. It is due to the continued proliferation of permanent or primary dental lamina to form a third two germ. So basically we have two, two uh, germs, that is one deciduous and one uh, permanent tooth germ. So in addition to that, there will be a third tooth germ why it is happening it is due to the proliferation of dental lamina from dental lamina we know we have uh, learned in uh, tooth formation from dental lamina the tooth arises so tooth origins so continuous proliferation so there will be additional uh, third tooth germ so that is supernumerary teeth so it could be uh, a normal tooth a rudimentary tooth or a miniature version of that normal tooth so it is most commonly uh, seen in permanent dentition rather than primary and in the maxilla uh, more uh, seen in maxilla compared to mandible so what happens when these are present so there will be always malposition of adjacent teeth because uh, this will uh, create crowding and it might prevent uh, the eruption of adjacent teeth so most commonly supernumerary teeth associated with cleidocranial dystosis so this is hereditary ectodermal dysplasia that is related to anodontia this is supernumerary teeth cleidocranial dystosis okay so we have supernumerary teeth 
classification under two headings one is based on the location and one is based on the morphology so based on the location we have mesiodents and we have fourth molar that is either it could be a paramolar or a distomolar and para premolar so mesiodents is the most common one it is seen between the two central incisors that is permanent central incisor uh, this could be a single tooth or a paired tooth or an impacted tooth or an inverted tooth so it can be in four versions single paired impacted and inverted it is basically a smaller version with con shaped crown and very short root so that is mesiodens between the central incisor it is very common and the fourth molar so there will be a fourth molar we have three molars first second and third so three molar in addition to that we have a fourth molar because it is supernumerary tooth so it could be a paramolar or a distomolar distomolar is a second most common because it is seen mostly uh, distal to the third molar so that is why it is known as distomolar or fourth molar so it is also known as distodens so, so patients will be having a four molar teeth in in place of three molars so this is distal to the third molar and also there could be a par, pa, paramolar that is just addition additional molar not exactly at the distal position of uh, third molar it could be between uh, first and second molar or it could be between second and third molar it will be usually a small and a rudimentary one so distomolar and paramolar and also para premolar additionally one premolar that is a third premolar will be there usually we have two premolars in uh, each side each quadrant so there will be a additional premolar so this is molar and para premolar so based on the location could be mesiodens paramolar distomolar para premolar now we have based on the morphology morphology we have four types that is conical tuberculate supplemental odontomes so conical is nothing but mesiodens it is uh, conical in shape uh, tuberculate is like barrel shaped uh, tubercle shaped uh, supernumerary tooth supplemental is uh, duplicated one and the important one is odontomes odontomes is nothing but hematomatous malformation hematomatous malformation means uh, it is not basically a neoplasm it is the same uh, normal tooth uh, tissues or normal tissues uh, it is uh, multiplied in a different way it grows in a different unusual way it results in a uh, specialized structure resulting hematoma so tooth tissues multiplies in a different way and becoming odontomes so we have two types of odontome one is complex and compound so if we have more than one type of tissue which is actually is known as composite odontome composite composite odontome so we have two types basically complex and compound in complex so you we cannot uh, basically um, distinguish between any particular uh, cells or tissues it is totally disintegrated whereas in compound the malformation uh, where the superficial area is similar to the normal tooth so um, uh, compound is uh, more or less like a uh, normal tooth uh, we can distinguish uh, layers of teeth but in complex it is totally disintegrated so odontomes is nothing but a hematomatous malformation the tooth tissue is replicated or grown in a different format and it has two type uh, composite means more than one type of tissue is there we should call it as composite odontomes and we have two types one is complex and compound complex totally disintegrated compound we can distinguish the layers so that's all about developmental disturbances of teeth with respect to mm, number so we have learned anodontia and supernumerary teeth supernumerary teeth also known as hyperdontia anodontia we have total partial false and pseudo supernumerary we have two types of classification based on location and morphology mesiodens paramolar distomolar para premolar conical tuberculate 
supplemental orondoms. Orondom we have two type complex and compound, which is coming under composite. So I'll come up with uh, developmental disturbances of shape or form in my next video. Thank you. So the disturbances of teeth which is seen in crown we have uh, nine types the first one is fusion gemination torodontism talons cusp or leong's cusp which is also known as dense evaginatus the next one is dense invaginatus peg lateral hutchison's incisors mulberry molar the last two are seen in syphilis congenital syphilis Whereas in root, we have concrescence, enamel pearl, dilaceration, flexion, and ankylosis. So this is a very, very important uh, session because each question will be asked as a short note. So all these are uh, asked because uh, not even one you can um, keep aside as unimportant. All are important and it is very frequently asked question in short notes. So now let's start with fusion. So what is fusion? Fusion as a uh, picture says it is the joining of two developmental tooth germ. It may involve the entire tooth length or just the root. So two tooth germ which is joining and making or looking like a single tooth. But there will be a slight separation between the teeth. So it is a bigger tooth rather than a single normal tooth which adjoining two teeth the point is there will be two separate developing tooth germ so that is fusion so it may just uh, involve the roots or uh, entire length will be mm, joined so it results in a single large tooth structure okay so if it is involving just the roots that will be like cementum and dentin will be shared not like this there will be cementum and dentin will be shared if it is joining at the root position suppose if it is like this so there will be cementum and root sharing this is crown sharing and if it is happening at the root end there will be cementum and dentin sharing between these two two germ and uh, fusion is basically seen uh, in lower teeth that is central and lateral uh, or lateral incisor and canines in lower teeth next we'll move on to the gemination gemination is nothing but fusion of two teeth from a single enamel organ so this is two enamel two tooth germ this is a single enamel organ uh, but it looks like two teeth because there will be a partial cleavage so it appears as two crowns but with same root canal okay from the clinical point of view it appears as two crown but it has only one root and one root canal so this is gemination fusion of two teeth from a single enamel organ so the exact uh, etiology is not known uh, possibly it could be due to trauma so fusion is different gemination is different fusion is a name itself gives a clue it is a fusion of two separate tooth germ it uh, appears as a bigger tooth but gemination is it is a splitting of just the crown portion so there will be a small cleavage and it appears as two crowns so it has a single uh, root or single root canal it may have two root canals now we have torodontism torodontism is a variation in tooth form so we have elongated crown and apically displaced furcation so you can see that the furcation is apically displaced very elongated crown similarly the pulp chamber also very elongated so it results in a pulp chambers that have increased apical occlusal height so the apical occlusal height is very increased so you can see the uh, occlusal uh, side and the apical side usually it is not this much elongated but this is a 
longer crown so since longer crown there will be a increased height of pulp chamber so it is most commonly seen in down syndrome and Klinefelter syndrome basically it doesn't require any treatment that is storodontism elongated crown germination is splitted crown this is fused crown okay and now we have talons cusp talons cusp is an additional cusp which is seen in mostly the lingual uh, side of um, anterior teeth additional uh, small uh, cusp like structure at the cingulum area we can uh, observe in few teeth so that is known as talons cusp which is also known as dense evaginatus so there will be extra growth so that is known as evaginatus so it extends from cj to the half of the incisal edge so this is a cj and it extends from half of the incisal edge so it appears as a small cusp at the lingual portion from the sing in the cingulum area of upper anterior teeth uh, that is also known as dense evaginatus so we have two structures in dense evaginatus that is the extra structures which is projecting outward the lungs premolar and then uh, talons cusp is coming under dense evaginatus now we have lynx premolar which is an accessory cusp uh, or a globule which is located on occlusal surface between buccal and lingual cusps of premolars so it is most commonly seen in premolars that's why it's got this name lynx premolar so it is nothing but a accessory cusp or a globule which is seen between buccal and lingual cusp of premolars so it can be uh, seen unilaterally or even bilateral conditions also uh, present so talons cusp and lynx premolar is known as dense evaginatus okay now we have uh, dense invaginatus or also known as dense indent so tooth within tooth so that's why it's known as dense indent so it is due to the deep surface invagination invaginations inward uh, growth of crown or root that is lined by enamel so it is invaginated so it is going inside so we have two forms one is coronal and radicular so this deep surface invagination of crown or root which will be lined by enamel so that will be lined by enamel this invagination this is type 1 type 2 type 3 or also we have coronal and radicular so depth varies from slight enlargement of cingulum to a deep infolding that extend up to apex okay so this is type 1 type 3 is very extended up to apex so we have three types uh, type 1 type 2 and type 3 so type 1 is confined to crown so this is type 1 type 2 is which extends below the CEJ junction and ends in a blind sac so it ends in a blind sac here so this is a blind sac and it may or may not communicate with adjacent dental pulp so sometimes it communicate this is a pulp so sometimes it communicate with the pulp sometimes it doesn't communicate so that is type 2 whereas type 3 which extends throughout uh, through the root so see the roots you can see it extends from the crown and it extends downwards towards the root and it perforates in the apical or lateral radicular area so you can see it perforates here it perforates here in the apical or lateral radicular area without any immediate communication with pulp so pulp is this red uh, color so it doesn't have any communication with the pulp okay but it separates or it coming uh, towards the uh, root tip that is it perforates in the apical or lateral radicular area but without any communication with pulp so type 1 is within the crown type 2 is a little more deeper but it is which is ending in a blind sac 
but it doesn't communicate with the pulp so this is a pulp okay this is a pulp that red uh, orange color type 3 is which perforates in the apical or lateral radicular area it has perforation in the root area but it doesn't uh, communicate with the pulp so that is uh, dense in uh, invaginatus or also known as dense indent okay so this is a commonly asked question dense evaginatus you can write talon's cusp and leung's cusp or leung's premolar and next one is dense invaginatus or dense indent so it has two names dense indent So we always get confused with dense evaginatus and dense invaginatus. So dense invaginatus and dense indent both has IN. So that is how you can remember dense invaginatus and dense indent. So you don't write dense indent for dense evaginatus. Okay. So you might be know the answer but writing the proper answer will only get fit you marks. So type 1, type 2, type 3, dense invaginatus or dense indent. Now we have peg lateral which we have seen uh, in our size anomaly that is microdontia which is seen as a tapered crown especially the uh, lateral incisor. And uh, next is the Hutchison's incisors. Hutchison's incisors is associated with congenital syphilis. So in Hutchison's incisor where central or lateral incisor are peg shaped or screwdriver shaped you can see there is a notching at the end and it is widely spaced notching and widely spaced with a crescent shaped deformity so there will be a crescent shaped deformity so you can see a crescent shaped deformity so it is uh, seen in congenital uh, syphilis similarly uh, there will be notching uh, notches on uh, their biting surfaces so always notches will be present on the biting surfaces which is named um, after Sir Jonathan Hutchison who is a English surgeon who first described it now we have mulberry molar which is also a condition seen in congenital syphilis in mulberry molars there will be multiple rounded rudimentary rudimentary enamel cusp or uh, which is seen on the permanent first molars so these doft molars with cusp covered with lots of globules or enamel projections gives it a mulberry appearance so these two conditions Hutchison's incisors and mulberry molars associated with congenital syphilis so uh, that's all about uh, developmental disturbances of crown that is regarding shape or form so we learn fusion germination torodontism dense evaginatus so talons cusp and leung's premolar comes in dense evaginatus dense invaginatus or dense indent peg lateral Hutchison's incisors mulberry molars so fusion is fusion of crowns germination there will be a twinning or a single enamel organ which gives a two crowns torodontism is elongated crown talons cusp seen in lingual uh, part of anteriors leung's premolar extra globule between the buccal and lingual cusp dense invaginatus there will be invagination which has type 1 type 2 and type 3 peg lateral which is a converged uh, lateral Hutchison's incisors notched crescent shaped incisors mulberry molars there will be enamel globules gives it a mulberry appearance which are seen in congenital syphilis uh, next we have the developmental disturbances with respect to the shape or form seen in root so i'll come up with that topic in my next video thank you hello everyone welcome back to another session in dentistry and more so let's continue our developmental disturbances of teeth related to shape or form so last session we had covered various anomalies uh, which we're seeing uh, with respect to crown so today's session is about the anomalies uh, with respect to shape or form seen in root so let's see what are the anomalies seen in root regarding shape or form
concrescence is when there is two fully formed teeth which joins at the root okay by cementum so it's like this when two different teeth joining at the root side by cementum it is known as concrescence so it is uh, only in cemental uh, side uh, it is not coming into coronal part only uh, roots are joined but the crowns are different so most commonly it is seen in maxilla and also in posterior part compared to uh, anterior part so compared to mandible it is commonly seen in maxilla and also compared to the anterior side it is seen mostly on posterior region and the common two teeth are involved the second molars second molars roots closely approximate adjacent impacted third molar so the second molar and the adjacent impacted third molar are united at uh, roots and it may occur before or after the teeth have erupted so usually involve only two teeth and we need x-ray for diagnosis and no uh, special treatment required for this condition so usually diagnosed or it um, found out when we take uh, when we take x-rays for other reasons so we can see there is a uh, joint uh, roots of two adjacent teeth mostly second molar and impact of third molar or the posterior region two teeth so that is concrescence the next is enamel pearl which is droplets of in ectopic enamel which is found on the roots okay it is commonly seen on bifurcated or trifurcated teeth may occur on single rooted premolar as well so it's seen as a small globule or enamel projection which is uh, seen between the trifurcation or trifurcation or even the single rooted premolars so maxillary molars are more commonly uh, associated with enamel pearl compared to mandibular molars and it consists only a nodule of enamel attached to dentin and it may have a core of dentin uh, which contains pulp horn and it, it is also detected while taking radiographs for other reasons and may cause stagnation at gingival margin but if they contain pulp this will be exposed when the pearl is removed so if it is uh, exposed if it contain pulp there will be uh, this will be exposed when this pearl is removed so that is about enamel pearl which is a droplet of ectopic enamel which is seen between the bifurcated or trifurcated teeth now we have dilaceration dilaceration is a bending of root so angulation or sharp bend or curve in root or crown of a formed tooth so why it is happening it is due to the trauma to developing tooth so there will be root to form at an angle to the normal axis so this is dilaceration it forms an at an angle so movement of crown or part of root from remaining developing root which results in a sharp angulation after the tooth complete its development so this particular trauma will results will cause the root to form at an angle compared to the normal axis so this movement of crown or this part of root from the remaining developing root which results in angulation and it is commonly seen in a syndrome known as ehlers danlos syndrome ehlers danlos syndrome associated with dilaceration now we have flexion flexion is deviation or bend restricted just to the root portion and usually this bend is less than 90 degrees so that is the difference between flexion and dilaceration dilaceration always the bend is greater than 90 degree and flexion the bend will be less than 90 degree this is also due to the trauma to the developing tooth and the last one is ankylosis ankylosis is submerged tooth so what happens is the fusion of teeth to the surrounding bone usually deciduous teeth especially mandibular second molar what happens it joins with the 
alveolar bone the root joins with the alveolar bone so extraction or uh, exfoliation will be difficult mm, because of its uh, fusion between the bone and this particular root it is commonly seen in mandibular second molars so these are the five developmental disturbances or anomaly with respect to teeth and especially root so we covered the developmental disturbances of size number shape and so let's wind up this uh, anomalies concrescence which is a joining of uh, roots by cementum enamel pearl is a globule or ectopic enamel present between the roots that is bifurcated or trifurcated dilaceration and flexion are the bending of root greater than 90 degree and less than 90 degree ankylosis is a fusion of teeth to the surrounding bone so i'll come up with a new topic in dentistry and more thank you hello everyone welcome back to a new session in dentistry and more today's topic is amylogenesis imperfecta so in developmental anomalies we have learned the various categories of anomalies it depends on size number shape of teeth and also the defects of enamel and dentine so amylogenesis coming under the defects of enamel so let's get into the details of amylogenesis imperfecta Amylogenesis imperfecta. The name itself gives some clue about this problem that is imperfect genesis of ameloblast. So genesis uh, is nothing but creation. Ameloblast means we know it gives rise to uh, enamel in future. So there is an imperfect uh, production or creation of ameloblast or ameloblast is not working perfectly. So it is a problem associated with ameloblast that means enamel. So enamel is not forming properly. So imperfect formation of enamel is nothing but amylogenesis imperfecta. So it has got uh, many names. One is AI. So AI is very popular nowadays. So the popular name is artificial intelligence but in dentistry AI is amylogenesis imperfecta and also we have another name hereditary enamel dysplasia so it is a hereditary condition dysplasia plasia means the production of cells so we know aplasia metaplasia dysplasia is improper production and also the hereditary brown enamel it is because of the color of particular enamel in amylogenesis imperfecta and also hereditary brown opalescent teeth because of the opalescent appearance of these teeth so that is about the various names it has got now let's see what is ai it is a group of hereditary defects of enamel it's not associated with any other generalized defects so it is solely exclusively attacking enamel or on the enamel it is an entirely ectodermal disturbances normal mesoderm is present so we know endoderm ectoderm and mesoderm are present various tooth layers or tooth germs and ectoderm give rise to uh, enamel so it is entirely an ectodermal disturbances not affecting mesoderm or other layers and it is a X-linked autosomal recessive or autosomal dominant disease. So it's about its uh, genetical um, transmission. It is a X-linked autosomal recessive or autosomal dominant disease. So how it transform, transfers from parent to child. So etiology is nothing but it is a hereditary condition. So obviously there will be mutation in proteins so we have many proteins in enamel formation such as enamelin 
amylogenin, amyloblastin, tefclin or amylotin. So either any of these proteins will be muted. So mutation will create a improper or imperfect enamel. So we have basically three types of amylogenesis imperfecta. Before that we need to know various stages of tooth formation. The first is a formative stage where the deposition of organic matrix happening. The second stage is calcification stage where the matrix is getting mineralized. And the third stage is it crystallizes, enlarges and matures. So these are the three processes starting from formative stage to maturity state. So if something happens in these stage will result in enamel uh, imperfect or enamel improper enamel that is if it affects on the formative stage it will result in hypoplastic ai if it is affecting affecting the calcification it is creating a hypocalcified ai and if it is affecting the maturation stage there will be hypomaturation so we know hypo means it is less than normal hyper means it is more than normal so it is not actually forming up to the normal stage it is something less than normal so hypoplastic hypocalcified and hypomaturative so hypoplastic uh, along with that we have one more type that is a fourth type which is a combination of hypoplastic and hypomaturative type it commonly seen along with Torodontism. So, hope you know what is torodontism. So, that is a fourth type along with hypoplastic, hypocalcified, and hypomaturative. So, these two combined hypoplastic and hypomaturative combined with torodontism will be the fourth type. So, the most common type is hypoplastic one, it accounts for 60 to 73 percent. Then, the hypomaturative one, it accounts for 20 to 40 percent. And the least one is hypocalcified. It is around 7% of total AI. So in hypoplastic, we have inadequate matrix formation because it's affecting the formative stage and reduced enamel thickness. There will be abnormal contour. The contour will be affected. We have a perfect contour in a normal tooth aligned or normal tooth anatomy. The contour will be there. The tooth will be contacting. Uh, mesial side and distal side so that will be lost in hyperplastic that is absence of interproximal contact because of the tooth will be where so it will be lost at the proximal surfaces it creates a particular appearance that is picket fence appearance before that it has a dentine and pulp chamber perfectly normal so it is affecting only enamel so we'll come back to the picket fence appearance so it gives rise to a picket fence appearance so what is picket fence so this is a picket fence because the interproximal areas are lost you imagine this black thing as a tooth the interproximal areas are lost because of the enamel enamel is very fragile it is lost at the interproximal area ultimately it gives rise to this type of appearance when we take a radiograph this type of fence we have seen in railway station hope you have seen in railway station this type of fence in uh, normal houses this type of fencing is not there so this type of fencing we know we have seen in railway station because it has interdental spaces similar to the picket fence so square shaped crown spaced and spacing between teeth and there will be picket fence appearance in hypoplastic amylogenesis imperfecta in hypocalcified the enamel will be softer than normal and it tends to chip from underlying dentine because of its softness and the enamel has a peculiar appearance that is snow capped teeth so it will be like snow capped snow will be there on the teeth that is nothing but more whiter appearance it is white opaque areas so these white opaque areas are seen as snow capped teeth 
so the affected enamel exhibits radio density similar to dentin that is a problem so it will be very difficult to differentiate enamel and dentin from radiograph because the radio density of enamel and dentin usually is very different but in this case the enamel and dentin is having equal radio density the enamel matrix will be normal and obviously the calcification is very poor and normal thickness will be there now we'll move on to the hypo maturity type the teeth become stained and rapidly wear down because the maturation process is hampered and and it become easily stained and easily wear down because of its thin uh, enamel so enamel is less radio opaque than dentin and hypomaturity type so i forgot to tell you about the prevalence of this condition that is 1 to 700 to 1 to 15000 now we'll move on to the clinical features so what are the clinical features of amelogenesis imperfecta the most common clinical feature is discoloration of teeth and lack of proximal contact and loss of vertical dimension so vertical dimension will be lost why because the incisal edges will be easily wear down and it it creates a open bite and there will be loss of vertical dimension and decreased masticatory uh, deficiency mastication will be always affected because of this uh, thin uh, friable enamel so enamel will be easily uh wear down from the it easily chips off from uh, dentin so always the mastication will be a problem and there will be anterior open bite and posterior open bite open bite is nothing but when teeth are occluding in normal condition there will not be any space between the teeth even if it is in the anterior side or posterior side but open bite means if teeth are occluding the teeth will not contact that is anterior if it is not contacting in the anterior side that will be anterior open bite if the teeth are not contacting at posterior side that will be posterior open bite and negative overjet so usually we have positive overjet that is the upper teeth um, at the front position and the lower teeth at the back position negative overjet is nothing but the reverse of it that is a cross bite condition the lower teeth will be at front position and the upper teeth will be inside of it so that will be their negative overjet and there will be altered vertical jaw relation so the vertical height and its the jaw relation will be changed so in radiographs we have already seen uh, picket fins appearance in hypoplastic so usually enamel uh, sometimes may appear completely lost or completely absent in radiographs sometimes radio density is similar to dentin making differentiation between enamel and dentin very difficult because usually how uh, in radiographs are interpreted the enamel and the dentin the radio density the enamel has high mineralization content that is around 96 percentage compared to dentin dentin has much lesser than 96 so this density mineral density is different so the radio density will be similarly different but in amelogenesis imperfecta the enamel is hypomineralized so that's why there will be uh, not much difference between the mineral content so likewise the radio density will be almost same so it is very difficult to differentiate enamel and dentin from a radiograph well coming to the histological explanation the hypoplastic there will be defect in matrix formation and sometimes there will be total absence of matrix in hypocalcification the defects in matrix structure and mineral deposition in hypomaturity there will be alteration in enamel rods and rod sheath structures so that is a histologic part in, in histologic there will be matrix uh absence sometimes with defects 
and hypocalcification it is a matrix uh, mineral deposition and matrix structure defects in hypomaturity there will be enamel rods and road sheath changes so how do we treat amelogenesis imperfecta we have various options to treat amelogenesis imperfecta uh, we can go for a auto treatment for correcting anterior open bite and vertical growth pattern we need to do a auto treatment sometimes not in all the cases sometimes we need to uh, do surgical approach that is extraction of few teeth and surgical correction of anterior uh, open bite and restorative treatment will be very common like the composite restoration composite restorations are uh, tooth colored restorations because since it is an anterior teeth the front teeth so aesthetic is a concern so uh, we can do composite restorations and also prosthetic uh, methods like uh, crowns can be done full metal crowns uh, on posterior teeth and ceramic or um, crowns in anterior or also we can do veneering so that's about our treatment part so that's how we uh, finishes our amelogenesis imperfecta it is a defect developmental anomaly related to the defect of enamel it has got many names hereditary enamel dysplasia hereditary brown enamel hereditary brown or palace teeth it is a ectodermal disturbance mutation in any of these proteins basically three types hypoplastic calcified maturity and picket fence is seen in hypoplastic snow capped seen in hypocalcified and the clinical features uh, radiographic and histological features and various uh, treatment options so i'll come up with a new session on dentistry and more thank you hello everyone welcome back to a new session on dentistry and more today's topic is dentinogenesis imperfecta as we had seen amelogenesis imperfecta just like the same way it was interpreted we need to interpret dentinogenesis imperfecta the imperfect formation of dentin or the problem with odontoblast so let's see the details of dentinogenesis imperfecta Dentinogenesis is a formation of dentin which starts even before amelogenesis. So the first tooth element is forming is dentin. Only after that enamel forms. So dentinogenesis is a first process happening while tooth formation, and it was odontoblast which creates dentin. So basically, two phases of dentinogenesis is there. The first one is organic collagen matrix formation later there will be deposition of hydroxy apatite crystals so the collagen matrix will be uh, laid out first after that there will be mineralization or hydroxy apatite crystals will be deposited so it is a autosomal dominant condition that is dentinogenesis imperfecta and it affects both deciduous and permanent teeth so now we'll move on to the classification so the most common classification is Shields classification. Then we have a revised classification and Whitcock classification. So the Shields classification is most commonly accepted and commonly used one. He classified dentinogenesis imperfecta into three types, type 1, 2 and 3. Type 1 is dentinogenesis imperfecta with osteogenesis imperfecta. Type 2 is dentinogenesis imperfecta without osteogenesis imperfecta i just made it as oi mm. and type 3 is a brand new wine type which is a rare form with multiple pulp exposure and periapical lesions in deciduous teeth and why it got this brand new wine name it is because brand new wine is a place in maryland usa so that place has reported this type of uh, dentinogenesis imperfecta for the first time 
and there were many cases reported in that area so that particular tentinogenesis imperfecta with multiple pulp exposure and periapical lesions in deciduous teeth named after the particular place. So Brandywine is a place in Maryland, USA. That is a type 3 classification in shield. In revised classification, tentinogenesis imperfecta 1 is type 2 of shield classification and in revised classification, dentinogenesis imperfecta 2 is type 3 shield classification. And in revised classification, there is no substitute for type 1 shield classification. So don't get confused. So we have only two types in revised classification that is dentinogenesis imperfecta 1 and 2, which corresponds with shields classification type 2 and type 3. Now let's see what is dentinogenesis imperfecta 1 which is shield type 2 or a palacent dentine or also known as captipone teeth. In etiology it is a mutation which causing this dentinogenesis imperfecta 1 that is DSPP gene the gene which is for dentine sialophosphoprotein. So the mutation in that gene causing Dentinogenesis imperfecta 1. Dentinogenesis imperfecta 1 is uh, type 2 shields classification. It is without osteogenesis imperfecta. So it can be distinct from osteogenesis imperfecta with a palacent teeth and affects only the teeth, not bones. So there will be no increased bone fracture. So when you get this type 1, never get confused with shield type 1. This is actually shield type 2. This is a revised classification. And uh, incidence is 1 is to 6000 or 8000. While moving on to the type 2, that is dentinogenesis imperfecta 2, which is shield type 3 or brandywine type. So it is, the mutation is not same as type 2 that is uh, DSPP it is different from um, this dentino imperfecta 1 but the difference is there will be enlarged pulp chamber and pulp exposure which is not present in this type 1 of dentinogenesis imperfecta in clinical features the gender predilection is almost same males and females are equally affected there will be blue, grey or amber brown and opalescent tooth. Few days after eruption, teeth may achieve a normal color following which they become translucent and finally become grey or brown with bluish reflection from enamel. The enamel may easily split readily from dentine when subjected to occlusal stress. So the first part is saying about the color change. Normally, it is uh, when it erupts, it is having normal color. Later, it's uh, getting changed to the uh, bluish opalescent one. And the second part about the uh, occlusal stress and it easily chips off that enamel. And there will be severe attrition and obliterated pulp chamber. Now, teeth are not very sensitive and dentin is basically soft and easily penetrable but caries, prone, uh, caries incidence is very less because of the structural change in dentin even though it has very soft dentin and it is easily penetrable caries is not very much uh, present in dentinogenesis imperfecta 2 so that is uh, shield type 2 and shield type 3 in radiographic features there will be bulb shaped or bell shaped crown with constriction at the cervical areas. So the cervical areas will be constricted. So it will be a bulb shaped or a bell shaped. So you know how a bulb or bell looks like it the topper end or the bottom end if it is keeping in upright or in the opposite direction the tip will be constricted. So like why is the cervical areas will be constricted and there will be thin and spiked roots 
Obliteration of coronal and radical pulp chamber is a unique feature of dentinogenesis imperfecta. But the cementum, alveolar bone and periodontal ligament are perfectly normal. So the type 2 that is shield type 3, brandywine type which has large pulp chamber with very thin enamel and dentine will give a peculiar appearance which is known as shell teeth. So it is shield type 3 and revised classification type 2. So that is shell teeth which is uh, commonly asked question shell teeth which is a radiographic feature with large pulp chamber with thin shell of dentine and enamel. In histopathology the enamel is normal the mandel dentine that is a narrow zone of dentine below enamel also normal the remaining dentine will be severely dysplastic with vast area of amorphous matrix with globular or interglobular foci of mineralization and there will be reduced number of dentinal tubules and the tubules are distorted irregular in shape widely spaced and larger in size and there will be absence of odontoblastic processes and degenerating cellular debris and there will be large areas of tubular dentine DEJ will be smooth and flattened instead of scalloped nature so which is actually responsible for early chipping of enamel if it is scalloped there will be a interlocking between enamel and dentine since it is very smooth or flattened the enamel will be easily chipped off and in chemical or uh, physical features there will be increased water content around 60 percentage more water content than normal and there will be decreased mineral content and micro hardness is near to cementum so while moving on to the treatment part the main uh, goal is to prevent the loss of enamel and dentine through attrition so in mild to moderate cases we can go for veneering bleaching Restorative procedures like uh, composites and amalgam, amalgam in posterior and composites in anterior teeth. In severe case, cases, it mostly we should do uh, prosthesis that is crown placement and always uh, we should uh, keep a uh, importance in maintaining the vertical dimension because the vertical dimension will be lost because of the attrition. So that's all about dentinogenesis imperfecta. The takeaway points are Brantuvine type, cap depond, so this is type 1 and this is type 2, that is revised classification and shell teeth is a radiographic appearance of type 2, that is uh, mostly you get confused between these two, this is shield classification and revised classification, so this is what we follow, revised classification, but we uh, correspond it with our shield classification. So this type 1 is type 2 of shield and this type 2 is type 3 of shield. So that's all about dentinogenesis imperfecta. It is a developmental anomaly involving uh, the dentine or the, um, uh, the odontoblast. So we had seen amylogenesis imperfecta which is amyloblast and enamel formation uh, related problem and dentinogenesis is something related to odontoblast and dentine formation. So I'll come up with a new topic in the industry and more. Thank you. Hello everyone. Welcome back to a new session in dentistry and more. Today's topic is a developmental anomaly known as dentine dysplasia. So last sessions uh, we had covered amylogenesis imperfecta and dentinogenesis imperfecta where the formation of enamel and dentine uh, is not proper uh, likewise this this is that is dentine dysplasia it is a abnormal development of odontoblast or dentine formation in an improper or abnormal way dysplasia means uh, we know it is abnormal development of cells within tissues or organs. So let's get into details of dentine dysplasia.
So dentin dysplasia, it is an autosomal dominant condition without a proper etiology. But there is reports uh, saying uh, it is a, a mutation of DSPP that is dentin cyalophosphoprotein could be one of the reason for dentin dysplasia. And it is a very rare disease which is seen in 1 in 1 lakh incidents. Basically it is classified as dentin dysplasia type 1 and type 2. So usually this is presented as a normal enamel with the atypical dentin and abnormal pulp pathology. So basically it has two types. One is type 1 or shield type 1 or type 2 or shield type 2. That is dentin dysplasia type 1 and dentin dysplasia type 2. Dentin dysplasia type 1 is radicular dentin dysplasia. So we know there are coronal dentin and radicular dentin. So this affects the radicular dentin. So most commonly it affects both the dentition, deciduous and permanent. The crown appears very normal but the problem is there is no or only rudimentary root development. That is why it is known as radicular dentin dysplasia. So the name itself gives a clue radicular dentin that is the root dentin. The root formation is very minimal or maybe there is no root present at all and it is also known as rootless teeth and regarding the pulp there will be incomplete pulp or there may be total obliteration and teeth may exhibit extreme mobility because there is no root or very rudiment root and exfoliate prematurely so it will exfoliate before the time of actual exfoliation and there will be malalignment and malpositioning due to the extreme mobility of teeth. So when there is no root, you can imagine what all the problems it may have. There will be mobility, it exfoliate prematurely, there will be malalignment and malpositioning. So in radiography, there will be short roots and sharp conical apical construction and crescent or half moon shaped pulp chamber will be present in dentin dysplasia type 1. Now let's move on to dentin dysplasia type 2 which is coronal dentin dysplasia where the problem is with crown or the coronal dentin. So the pulpal obliteration will be partial and the peculiar appearance of pulp chamber or coronal pulp chamber is thistle tube or flame shaped. Thistle tube or flame shaped pulp is seen in type 2. Rootless teeth is type 1. And the thread like root canals are another feature and there will be absence of periapical radiolucency. And teeth roots are of normal shape and contour. So here the problem is with coronal dentin but here it is radicular dentin so the root is rudimentary. Here the roots are normal and radiologically the multiple pulp stones will be there and thistle tube or flame shaped appearance can be seen. So thistle tube or flame shape is in type 2, rootless in type 1, crescent or half moon shaped pulp chamber in type 1. So there will be blue and amber discoloration seen in dentin dysplasia type 2 but only with deciduous dentition, permanent dentition it looks normal. But deciduous dentition, there will be blue and amber discoloration. While well, moving on to histopathology, there will be deeper dentin show a typical tubular pattern. That is a dentin which is at the deeper part, a typical tubular pattern with an amorphous a tubular area and irregular organization. And this is very important, the lava flowing around boulders. So when there is normal dentin tubule formation happens but there are blockades so blockage is there so this dentin tubule formation still happens but it is happening around this blockade so it looks like a lava so when a volcano erupts the lava is uh, flowing or overflowing around the boulders around the obstacles so it gets that peculiar characteristic appearance lava flowing around boulders so when we take a cross section, we 
can see this peculiar appearance of dentine formation around the obstacles the lava flowing around the boulders so that is a histopathology feature of dentine dysplasia so that's all about dentine dysplasia the takeaway points are rootless teeth that is type 1 thistle tube or flame shaped seen in type 2 lava flowing around the boulders it is a histopathology feature and crescent or half moon shaped pulp chamber in type 1 in management of dentine dysplasia proper oral hygiene measures periapical curatage and retrograde endodontic treatment so that's all about dentine dysplasia so it's a developmental anomaly affecting dentine which has two types coronal and radicular dentine types so i'll come up with a new topic in dentistry and more thank you hello everyone welcome back to a new session on dentistry and more today's topic is ghost teeth or regional odonto dysplasia which is also known as odontogenesis imperfecta this comes under third year oral pathology and a1 in first year dental histology so it comes along with amelogenesis imperfecta and dentinogenesis imperfecta the first one was affecting enamel dentinogenesis imperfecta affecting the dentine and this affects both enamel and dentine so let's see what is ghost teeth or regional odonto dysplasia ghost is it's nothing but abnormalities of enamel dentine and pulp so it is the etiology is basically unknown so it could be local trauma radiation hypophosphatasia hypocalcemia and hyperpyroxia so due to these reasons there will be abnormalities in enamel dentine and pulp so it is most commonly recognized at the age of tooth eruption that is between 2 to 4 years in deciduous and 7 to 11 years in permanent teeth that is mostly the central incisor lateral incisor and canines so the ghost teeth or regional arundo dysplasia it is an abnormal enamel dentine and pulp formation especially in the maxillary anterior teeth it can be seen both in deciduous and permanent dentition so let's see the etiology so it could be a local trauma or irradiation or hypophosphatasia hypocalcemia or even hyperpyrexia so what happens is there is abnormal formation of enamel dentine and pulp so it is most commonly recognized at the age of two to four years in deciduous dentition and seven to eleven years in permanent dentition so during this period the maxillary central incisor lateral incisor canines are erupting and it is most commonly seen in maxillary teeth or the anterior teeth so what happens is these teeth sometimes fail to erupt or if they erupt they show yellow formed yellow deformed crowns with a rough surface because it has very hypoplastic hypomineralized hypo uh, um, hypomineralized enamel and dentin which is uh, not properly mineralized so they are very easy to undergo uh, staining and uh, deformation so there will be a rough surface and there will be a stained uh, yellow stained uh, deformed crowns so sometimes they won't erupt at all if it erupts it shows in this way so the affected tooth have very thin enamel and these teeth appear as crumbled that is because of its peculiar radiographic feature it shows abnormal radiolucency that is marked reduction in the radio density so the abnormal radiolucency makes the tooth as a ghost appearance that's why it's known as ghost teeth because the hypoplastic hypocalcified dentine and enamel with large pulp chamber makes it a ghost appearance 
there will be big pulp chamber very thin enamel very thin dentine makes it a ghost appearance that is why it's known as ghost teeth and it is regional odontoplasia it is affecting the particular region and the odonto and dysplasia is malformation or improper formation of cells dysplasia plasia is multiplication of cell so the name itself gives a clue so most of the diseases syndromes cyst everything gives a clue we get a bit of answer from the title itself so that is how it is becoming a ghost teeth a large pulp chamber with very thin enamel and tendon so in this case the roots will be very short and poorly outlined and there will be localized arrest in tooth development and it is most commonly diagnosed by the clinical appearance and radiographic appearance there will be irregular shaped brown discoloration and radiographic we can easily see in the ghost appearance of tooth and management either we can uh, do extraction of these teeth and undergo um, a prosthetic uh, rehabilitation and also restorative procedures uh, such as root canal treatment can be done so it depends on the patient's uh, clinical profile so that's all about ghost teeth uh, or regional odontodysplasia or odontogenesis imperfecta so this is odontogenesis imperfecta so dentinogenesis imperfecta affecting dentin amelogenesis imperfecta is affecting enamel and odontogenesis imperfecta is affecting both enamel dentin and pulp giving a ghost teeth so i'll come up with a new session dentistry and more thank you